This is Willow, Google's new computer chip, and people are going absolutely crazy about it because what it's just done is crazy. It's impossible. It's made a calculation that would take one of today's fastest supercomputers 10 septillion years. That's 10 to the power of 25 years, a number way, way older than the age of the universe. Except Willow done it under five minutes. Now, people are saying that the chip's computational speed might be explained by borrowing resources from parallel universes. In other words, this is proof that we're just one universe in many universes, in the multiverse. Why do they think this? Is this way too much information? Want me to break it down for you? Hey Space Cats, I'm Dr. Maggie Lou, and in this week's video, this is everything that you need to know about quantum computing and Google's new quantum chip. So Google's new chip is unlike your typical computer chip. Willow is a special type of chip a quantum chip designed specifically for quantum computing. So before I tell you my thoughts on the multiverse claim, let us talk about what quantum computing is. Now in traditional computing and in traditional chips, such as those in laptops and smartphones, operations are based on binary logic. And this means that data is represented as bits. These can exist in one of two states, zero or one. For example, the binary representation of the number zero is zero, 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 zero. For number one, it's zero, 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 one. For number two, it's zero, zero, one, zero. For three, it's zero, zero, one, one. For four, it's zero, one, zero, zero. And so on and so on, you get the picture. Classical computer chips manipulate these bits through electrical signals and logic gates, so AND, OR, and ADD, to execute operations following straightforward sequential computations. So the AND logic gate would take two binary values, each taking values of zero or one, as input, and then returns one only if both inputs are equal to one. Otherwise, it would return zero. In practice, at the hardware level, a high voltage would represent one, and a low voltage would represent zero. So in classical computers, we have transistors that act like switches to control the flow of these electrical signals and voltages so that we can process and store information as sequences of ones and zeros. Quantum computing harnesses the mind-bending principles of quantum mechanics to process information in a fundamentally different way to classical computers. So in quantum chips, like Willow, instead of representing data as bits, they're represented as quantum bits, or qubits for short. Qubits exploit the principles of quantum mechanics, allowing them to exist in multiple states simultaneously, a phenomenon known as superposition. This means that a qubit can be zero, one, or a combination of both at the same time. Remember, in quantum mechanics, before a measurement is made, a quantum system exists in a superposition of all possible states. And this means that it's in a probabilistic mix of different outcomes, not definitively in any single one of them. The act of measurement is what forces the system to choose one of the states. The superposition is then said to collapse, and the system is found in a single definite state. So for example, in Jung's double slit experiment, before we observe which slit an electron goes through, it behaves as if it's going through both of the slits simultaneously. Now this creates this interference pattern on the detection screen, which is typical of what you expect from a wave. But if we place a detector at one of the slits to see which one the electron is going through, the interference pattern disappears. The electron now behaves like a classical particle, going through only one slit or the other, not both. The act of observing collapses the wave-like superposition into a particle-like de definite path. Or in Schrodinger's cat example, before we open the box, the cat is said to be in a superposition of being both alive and dead. It's not one or the other until we actually peek. 
When we open the box, we perform a measurement. The superposition of alive and dead collapses and we find the cat in one of those definite states, either alive or dead. Mathematically, this is the wave function and it's represented as a linear combination of all the states, of all the scenarios. So in our quantum chip, it actually looks like this. Where the term on the left, thigh, is the qubit state. And the terms on the right, zero and one, are the basis states scaled by a factor alpha and beta, which are complex numbers representing the probability amplitudes of the qubit being in state zero or one respectively. This means that the magnitude of alpha squared plus the magnitude of beta squared equals one by definition. And this just ensures that the probabilities of all possible scenarios add up to one. Measuring a quantum state collapses the superposition, yielding a single classical outcome, either zero or one, not both of them. So just like in classical computing, the foundation for representing numbers in quantum computing is the binary system. A sequence of qubits can represent a binary number. For example, using three qubits, the number zero would be, one would be, and so on and so on. The key difference here is that qubits can be in a superposition. So a three qubit system can be in a superposition of all of those above eight numbers or states simultaneously. It could look something like this where each alpha term is a complex probability amplitude where the squared magnitude of it represents the probability of the system collapsing to that particular state when measured. This means that the quantum system can effectively hold multiple numbers all at the same time with each number having a certain probability amplitude associated with it. For free qubits, we can represent integer numbers zero through seven, but the range of integers that can be represented increases exponentially with the number of qubits that you have. So n qubits can represent two to the power of n different integer values. This enables quantum computers to handle exponentially larger state spaces compared to classical computers. They don't hold all the numbers at once in a classical sense. The actual computational power of quantum systems comes from how quantum algorithms manipulate these superpositions and leverage inference to focus on the correct answer. Focus. Now, quantum mechanics is built on linear algebra. So the quantum states, like the qubit superposition above, are represented as vectors. So a state zero is written as one zero and a state one is written as zero one. And operations on those states that are analogous to logical gates in classical computers are called quantum gates. And these are typically represented as matrices. For example, the Pauli X gate is the quantum equivalent of the NOT gate in classical computing. The NOT gate outputs a bit opposite of the bit that is put into it. So in not, if you input zero, it would output one. And if you input one, it would output zero. The Pauli X gate, the quantum version, is given by the matrix zero, one, one, zero. And applying it to the state zero, we get which is equivalent to the state one. So the gate transforms the state zero into the state one and applying it on the one state, you would get the state zero. Let's see what happens when we apply the Pauli gate to a qubit, which is in superposition. So applied to a qubit in superposition, the Pauli X gate swaps the amplitudes of alpha and beta. So it swaps the probabilities. Linear algebra is the very foundation upon which quantum mechanics and consequently quantum computing is built. It's all just matrix multiplication and it provides the mathematical language and tools to describe, manipulate and understand quantum phenomena. 
But it's way more than that. It means that quantum computers themselves are particularly well suited for performing linear algebra tasks, which is why they offer potential speed ups for certain problems that can be formulated in terms of linear algebra. So things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. But in addition to this, and the fact that they can store massive ranges of numbers, qubits can also become what we call entangled. You know, as time went on, I got into a different kind of entanglement, different kind of entanglement. Now, entanglement is a quantum phenomenon where two or more qubits become linked in such a way that they share the same fate, regardless of the distance separating them. A common example of an entangled state is the Bell state. Now, this state describes two qubits. It's a superposition of both qubits being zero, or both qubits being one. If we measure the first qubit of the Bell state and find it to be zero, then we instantaneously know that the second qubit must also be zero. Even if it's light years away, it can't be zero one or one zero. This instantaneous correlation is what Einstein called spooky action at a distance because it seemed to violate the principle of locality. The idea that an object is only directly influenced by things in its immediate surroundings. This property is what allows quantum computers to perform many calculations in parallel, making them exponentially more powerful for certain problems. When qubits are entangled and in a superposition, when you apply a quantum operation, it affects all of those superposed states simultaneously. So if we go back to the Bell state example, if we apply a gate to one of the entangled qubits, that operation acts on the entire entangled state, which is a superposition of zero, zero and one, one. So imagine we have N entangled qubits. Due to the superposition, they can exist in two to the power of n states simultaneously. And if we perform an operation on these qubits, it's like performing the operation on two to the power of n classical states all at once in just one operation. This is where the exponential speed up arises. If you instead did it the classical way, you would have to make two to the power of n calculations. But in quantum computing, you just make one. But entanglement is very, very fragile. Interactions with the environment, like any noise or changes in the temperature, can easily destroy the entanglement, a process known as decoherence. Now, this is the biggest challenge in building practical quantum computers, protecting them from decoherence. And that's one of the reasons that most quantum computers will be cryogenically cooled to less than minus 272 degrees Celsius. So like the temperature of space. It's also really hard to make quantum chips with a lot of qubits. Maintaining quantum coherence time becomes increasingly challenging as the number of qubits in a system increases. This is the length of time a qubit can maintain its intended state before it incurs decoherence. Now this is because as you add more and more qubits to a system, the surface area of that quantum system increases. And this means that there's more points of contact with the environment, making it more susceptible to external influences like noise and temperature that would cause decoherence. You also get a lot more potential interactions between the qubits themselves in the system with more and more qubits. So even small errors in individual qubit operations can accumulate and lead to significant errors in the overall computation. Now, this is why Google's Willow chip is so impressive. It has five times better quantum coherence time, which means more time for complex computations. But more importantly, they show that the more qubits used in Willow, the more qubits that they add to the system, the more the errors are reduced. Now, onto the multiverse theory. To test Willow's performance, Google tested it on a problem that's designed to be very hard for classical computers, but relatively easy for quantum computers. The problem is random circuit sampling, where it will run a randomly generated sequence of quantum operations known as circuits 
on the qubits. This will create some complex entangled quantum state and then the quantum computer will then measure the qubits producing a string. Repeating this process will generate a sample of bit strings. In classical computing, this is really difficult because you'd need to keep track of all of the probabilities of all of the possible states of the qubits throughout the computation. For n qubits, there are 2 to the power of n possible states. This means that the amount of memory required to store these amplitudes will grow exponentially with the number of qubits that you have. Willow was able to complete the problem in under five minutes, but it would take the fastest classical supercomputer approximately 10 to the power of 25 years, which is more than the current age of the universe to complete. But then again, it's an easy problem for quantum computing, but not classical computing. Now, quantum computing is still in its very early stages. Building and controlling these systems is incredibly hard. And to be honest, I feel like we're still far away from getting anything practical out of it. To put it into context, Willow is operating with just 105 qubits, whereas the chip in your phone has over 10 billion transistors that control those zeros and ones in your classical computing way. We'll need hundreds of thousands of qubits, minimum, just to get anything comparable to a classical computer on most tasks. But the example that I talked about shows that there are some problems that can be more efficiently solved with quantum computing. I already mentioned machine learning, but also for chemistry and material science, it would be game changing. Now, the last bit that we're all dying to know, does this prove that there are many parallel universes and do we live in a multiverse? We've learned so far that quantum computing relies on a phenomenon known as superposition, a probabilistic mix of states before measurement. And then measurement forces the system to collapse into a single definite state. But the mechanism of collapse is still debated. We still don't know what causes it. But one way that we can avoid collapse is the many worlds interpretation. This says that a quantum computer isn't just performing computations on superpositions within a single universe, but it's effectively performing computations in parallel across multiple universes. So every possible outcome of a quantum event exists in a separate branching universe. So it's not really a collapse at all. They all happen, but just in different universes. In reality, quantum computing does not prove the multi-wave interpretation. It's all just philosophical and it can't be proven. Quantum computing works regardless of which interpretation of quantum mechanics you believe in. The question of whether there are parallel universes remains one of the biggest open questions in physics. And whilst there's a lot of theoretical promise, Demonstrating practical quantum advantage for real world machine learning problems is still an ongoing research area. I mean, Willow's coherence time, the time all those qubits stay stable is just 68 microseconds. It's tiny. We have a long way to go yet, but that's all I have time for this week. Thank you to my YouTube Perks members for supporting this video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to leave me a like, share and subscribe. Soaring past Mars